your service with Haber and Martinez. I'm Haber, that's Martinez. And today we're here to talk to you about a show which I have captioned, Police Abuse of Position and Power for Personal Profit. There's a lot of P's in there. Uh, it's a real world case of alleged, another P, public corruption. Mm -hmm. um, as we've done for the last couple of shows, uh, Ed selected, this time this week, Ed selected the, uh, the newsworthy and timely article that we're going to discuss today. Um, it is a federal criminal prosecution, unlike what we usually discuss, which are state court cases, uh, either in Dade or Broward County. Uh, you may notice that I tend to focus on the Broward ones because the probable cause affidavits, that is the sworn statement of facts and circumstances that law enforcement alleges uh, as the basis for constituting their probable cause for the arrest, is readily available on the Broward County Clerk of Courts website noting that I'm going to throw the Miami-Dade County Clerk of Court under the bus publicly. We are the only county in the state that does not have those A-forms online. Uh, and so it's more difficult and complicated to get them here in Miami than it is uh, elsewhere in, in the state. And particularly, the same holds true for the federal system, which went electronic long before uh, the state of Florida did. So the feds have a, a system called PACER, which is a public access system. And we were able, through PACER, to pull the, what is called in this case, a criminal complaint. We'll explain a little bit more about that. But it's basically the same as an arrest report that you would find in state court. It's a statement of probable cause. It's the government's basis for moving forward to justify their arrest and asking the court uh, to handle the proceedings in the case. So with that, uh, we're going to be talking about a city of Miami police officer, or more accurately, a soon-to-be ex-city of Miami police officer, uh, who was arrested last week on Thursday. He was taken into custody. The Southern District of Florida, Florida has three different federal districts, Northern, Cent Northern, Middle, and Southern. Obviously, we're here in the Southern District. It goes from Fort Pierce all the way down to Key West. So he was arrested, I believe, in Palm Beach County, where he resides, um, for crimes that were committed in Broward County and I believe also in Palm Beach County. Um, it was a joint task force between the FBI, the DEA, and the City of Miami Police Department, specifically their Internal Affairs Division. So uh, this individual, soon to be ex-police officer Fresnel Sinat, uh, again, was arrested last Thursday, which was November 16th, I believe, and he was charged with three different counts. One, uh, extortion under the federal Hobbs Act, uh, but extortion under color of official right, uh, as well as an attempt. He was also charged with theft of government funds, and he was charged with attempted possession with intent to distribute cocaine. We're gonna talk about all of these things throughout the course of the show. And in fact, I'm gonna read some stuff off to you. I'm not going to read the entire criminal complaint because it's a, a long document, but I will cherry pick a few things. And I will also uh, read from the official uh, US Attorney's Office press release, two paragraphs that kind of sum up the arrest. So it'll make it a lot shorter than, than going through the entire uh, criminal complaint. Um, anything you want to add before I go ahead and read that off to the folks, Ed? No, just I was going to say, I think reading some of these things are, I don't know if it's funny. It's certainly probably not funny to Mr. Shannat, but, um, and, and, and when I say funny, I obviously, I say that tongue in cheek because, you know, Michael, I think you and I have discussed this, what, what this guy allegedly has done. And again, it's allegedly, we say that because that's the way we really should do it. But I think when you read the criminal complaint, you're going to read some of the stuff that he is allegedly recorded saying, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when you see the things that Michael reads, how he's recorded the things he's saying that he was recorded saying, um, it's, it's despicable because it's one thing to commit a crime, but it's another thing when you take an oath to uphold and protect, to uphold the laws of the state of Florida and protect the people that live here in the state of Florida, for then you turn around and commit those crimes. It's just, it's despicable. It really is. So that's all I got to say. Yeah. Well, I, I want to just touch on, on what you said a little bit also. And, and that's something that I've talked about in the promo materials. By the way, if anybody takes a look at the promo materials that we put up, 
I put a link to the criminal complaint and you can simply cut and paste that onto your web browser and you can read the document for yourself uh, at any time. It's very important to understand, I don't care if it's a state court case, I don't care if it's a municipal case, if it's a federal case, it's irrelevant. Anytime anybody is arrested anywhere for anything in the United States of America, the Fifth Amendment guarantees them a presumption of innocence. And that's why Ed used the word alleged. The government is entitled 110% to throw that presumption of innocence under the bus. In fact, that's their job. Their right. job is to presume that you are guilty if the evidence suggests that you're guilty. Because if they don't believe you're guilty, if they don't have an abiding conviction of guilt, they shouldn't be prosecuting you. Right. Charges right. should not be brought. But for the rest of us, for jurors, for judges, for lay people, for citizens, uh, we have to abide by that Fifth Amendment unless and until the government overcomes that presumption by presenting admissible, competent, substantial evidence that overcomes their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So alleged is very important. Unfortunately, and, and one of the other things we're going to talk about, and I know I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but, but it is important for context. Most arrests are in the moment. They're not pre-planned. They're not thought out. They're not the subjects of protracted investigations. Uh, they just happen because a call is made or because an officer happens to stumble upon something or dispatch or, or what have you. Uh, and so there's no time to really think these things through. They have to be processed in the moment and dealt with in real time. But in a case like this, you have an actual investigation, albeit by federal standards, a pretty short one. It was only one month that the, that the feds were looking at this guy. Right. Um, and, and in the course of a month, they managed to gather a lot of evidence. So, you know, when you, when you are being targeted, when you are the subject of a criminal investigation, especially in one like this, uh, you know, a federal and state task force, when they really are throwing every tool and weapon that they have against you, which is basically an unlimited amount of manpower and resources, they're documenting everything. And so during the course of this month, investigation, this month-long investigation, they've got this guy on audio. They've got this guy on video. They've got him uh, engaging in conversations with uh, confidential informants. They've got him bragging to third parties about criminal acts that he allegedly committed even before this. So th the sheer weight of the evidence, and, and, and again, I'm bringing this all up for a purpose and to tie it together back to that word alleged. When Ed and I look at that police report, when we read that probable cause affidavit, we're looking for any kind of a chink in the armor. I don't know. I, I mean, I guess the best analogy, or maybe not the best, but the first analogy that comes to mind is Smaug the Dragon from uh, the Hobbit series. How, uh, you know, the guy was able to shoot him in that one little area where he was missing one little scale, and that's the only way they could penetrate him. That's kind of what we do when we read these, these complaint arrest affidavits, statements of probable cause. We look for that chink in the armor, that missing plate, something that we can take our little chisel and, and just start chipping away at because flagrant constitutional violations are few and far between. Correct. However, they're there. They exist every now and then. Uh, and, and, and sometimes even officers will admit it because they know what they did and they know it was wrong, but they did it anyhow. But either way, alleged becomes very important in the vernacular for us. And during jury selection, Ed and I will sit there and harp on that until, you know, the judge tells us to shut up. And even then we'll continue because it's very important that we weed out anybody who thinks that just because somebody was arrested, they must be guilty. Just because somebody's sitting in a courtroom, they must be guilty. Just because somebody's got a criminal defense lawyer at the table next to them, they must have done something or they wouldn't be there. So but that, Michael, if I can interrupt you, believe it or not, what? for the audience to understand. Yeah, there are even some judges who miss that concept. I won't say about any that are particularly on the bench now, although there are some on the bench right now <clears throat> that don't understand that concept that everybody's innocent until proven guilty. I will hark back to a situation once briefly, and then I'll, you know, I'll let you start reading the affidavit. Um, I was arguing a, a bond for a client once years ago. And he was accused of murder and attempted murder. And one judge had given him a bond, uh, but had said something while he, when we were in the, finishing it up. And long story short, the victim, I mean, the, the um, yeah, the victim of the, of the family, believe it or not, tried to have him recused that he had to recuse himself. So he went to the new judge. 
And when I was arguing for the new judge to just re to, to give him the same exact bond that the first judge did, she said no. She said she was going to give him no bond whatsoever. And then started yelling at me, Michael. She's no longer on the bench. Started yelling at me. But she had been around forever. Believe me, if I tell you the name, you know who she is. She was around for a very long time. Started yelling at me and said, he murdered somebody, didn't he, Mr. Martinez? And I had to keep telling her, no, Your Honor, at this I, right now, he's accused of having murdered someone. And she, she kept yelling at me, he murdered somebody. So the reason Michael and I are harping on it so much is that regardless of what lip service people give us, including certain judges and prosecutors, some of them are full of it and they need it banged into their head. As prosecutorial as I was as a prosecutor, Michael, be honest. I was fair. I was fair. Now, if I, as a prosecutor, believed he was guilty, which is the only reason I should bring a case to trial, is if I believe not just that he's guilty. Remember, the prosecutor's job is not to believe he's guilty. And the only person in that building who has this belief is the prosecutor. The prosecutor's job is to file charges if he believes that the guy's guilty and he can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. So even if it's a prosecutor, which has happened to me many times, I thought somebody was guilty. I really did. I really believed he was guilty, but I didn't think I had enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I either <clears throat> took all charges or I had to dismiss the charges. And so that's why Michael is harping on it because it's real simple and pretty to say it, but it's a little harder when the real world smacks you in the face and you're looking at somebody who's committed a heinous crime or at least is accused rather of committing a heinous crime. <clears throat> and we need to keep our emotions in check because people are wrong sometimes. I don't think it's particularly the situation in this guy's case, but I'm just saying. Well, we'll let the audience come to their conclusion. This is, I'm just going to read two quick paragraphs from the U.S. Attorney's Office press release. Because again, it's a lot quicker than, than reading the entire criminal complaint. And it, and it basically sums it up. But I'm going to preface it by saying this guy, this officer, this subject, this defendant, this accused individual was done by a confidential informant. Somebody went to the FBI and said, I have information about a guy and I'd like that information to assist me in getting a better deal in my own case. That's basically what happened. And we're going to talk more about confidential informants and the nature of, of climbing up the, the law enforcement ladder and how this works during the course of the show. But that's how this whole thing started. Somebody went to the FBI, said, I've got information on a, on a city of Miami police officer who does drug ripoffs. And um, the FBI said, great, let's let's grab a couple undercover agents and we're going to pose as drug dealers and we're going to set up pretend drug deals and we'll give you the information. You can feed it to this police officer. And then if he acts on it, we'll we'll take him down. And and obviously, if, if he gets arrested and convicted, uh, you will receive some benefit. Uh, off of your own personal situation. With that said, this is what the U.S. Attorney press release reads. According to the criminal complaint, CNAT, in, that's the, the accused, <clears throat> in conjunction with an individual whom he believed to be involved in drug trafficking, that's the confidential source, agreed to use his Miami Police Department issued unmarked police vehicle and position to conduct a traffic stop on a driver who was represented to be carrying a large amount of drug proceeds. After making the arrangements, CNET carried out this traffic stop on the evening of November 3rd, 2023, using his lights and siren to pull over the vehicle, which was being driven by an undercover agent who was posing as a drug trafficker who had a backpack containing what was represented to be drug proceeds. As the complaint details, CNET identified himself as, quote, Officer Martez of the Miami Police Department Dade County Narcotics Unit. He told the driver that he had been investigating him and then gave the driver the option of giving CNAT the backpack, which was filled with $52,000 in $100 bills, or going to jail. CNAT then took the bag of money, let the driver leave, and met up with the individual who had given him the information, tendering $13,000 as his portion and keeping the other 39,000 for himself. 
CNAT followed this up by conducting another traffic stop theft in conjunction with that same individual. As the complaint explains, CNAT asked the individual if he had anyone who they could stop and steal drugs and money from. This led to CNAT once again using his Miami Police Department unmarked vehicle and police lights to stop a different undercover agent who he had been told would be transporting both money and, quote, seven bricks, which is a street term for kilograms of cocaine. This traffic stop took place late in the evening of November 16th in the area of Deerfield Beach in Broward County. During the stop, CNAT introduced himself as Officer Martez of the Broward County Sheriff's Office Narcotics Unit. Once again, CNAT pretended to have been investigating the driver and gave him a choice of either giving up the drugs and the money or going to federal prison. CNAT then took the duffel bag containing $80,000 in $100 bills and seven kilograms of fake cocaine and allowed the driver to leave. When CNAT arrived at the location prearranged to split the proceeds, he was arrested. The seven kilogram shaped packages and the large quantity of $100 bills were recovered from inside of his official Miami Police Department vehicle. So now you know basically the sum and substance of what this guy did. He was set up on a fake, what he believed to be a drug trans, a drug deal Subsequent to a drug deal, the money guy driving away to do a cash ripoff. But what he took were marked government bills from an undercover FBI agent in a vehicle that was completely wired for sound and audio. So everything that happened, all of these conversations, when he identifies himself as Officer Martez of the Miami Beach Police Department, Dade County Narcotics Unit, this is not words. I've worked with, done cases with the FBI before. I've, and and by the way, their their electronic recording equipment makes Miami Dade County, which is pretty sophisticated, look like a joke. I mean, Spielberg right. Spielberg quality recordings come out of these vehicles. Okay, so you I mean on, they'd survive an IMAX. So this guy, when they say that it's there, it's there. This isn't a bluff. These are not. FBI agents, or if it were a local department, the odds are it wouldn't be a police officer uh, just fermenting a bunch of nonsense and putting it into a report that doesn't exist. If the feds say they have this guy on tape, they've got this guy on tape. Especially this guy. Let's be honest. They and when they and when they quote and when they quote him in the criminal complaint as having said X, they're quoting it because that's what you're going to hear when they play the tape. They, they, they knew who this target was, Michael. They knew there'd be an extraordinary amount of scrutiny and media coverage. Um, I would bet that they didn't lie and that they were very careful to write exactly what happened because they knew there's going to be a lot of scrutiny. Now, I'm just going to read two paragraphs from the, from the criminal complaint because, again, it's background. In September of 2023... Your affiant interviewed a confidential human source who was being investigated for involvement in narcotics trafficking. This confidential human source stated that she, he, she had been told that CNAT had previously conducted traffic stops of individuals known to have just engaged in drug transactions for the purpose of stealing the drugs and the money of those individuals that those individuals were transporting. The CHS indicated that CNAT would use his official MPD-issued police vehicle and be in his MPD uniform when he conducted these traffic stops and thefts. The CHS informed your affiant that he, she was aware of this information through a mutual friend of both the CHS and CNAT, who had been in frequent contact with the CHS and had expressed interest in utilizing the CHS for setting up drug transactions and or providing intelligence about drug transactions in the near future. The CHS has a prior federal conviction for drug trafficking and is currently cooperating with multiple law enforcement agencies on a number of matters in an effort to receive favorable consideration in connection with the other crimes for which he or she is currently under investigation. As part of the CHS's cooperation efforts, the CHS agreed to consensually record conversations and meetings with the associate and CNAT under the direction and supervision of your affiant and other law enforcement agents in furtherance of this investigation. The investigation to date has utilized CA the CHS, FBI undercover agents, and several other law enforcement officers. 
Video and or audio recordings have been made throughout this investigation, which captured CNAT coordinating schemes and conducting traffic stops of two individuals whom he was told had just engaged in drug transactions with the intent of stealing money and or drugs involved in those illegal transactions. In addition to reviewing the consensual recordings made during this investigation, your client and other law enforcement personnel involved in the investigation have also reviewed text messages that were exchanged between the CHS and CNAT and or the associate. And I just want to jump onto a quick aside here because those text messages were sent. What was the name of the app? Do you remember? It was like Signals or something like that. Oh, uh, yeah, Signal. Signal. So the app that they were using was called Signal, and it's an encrypted messaging app, right. which, is only, which is only good if you happen to be messaging with someone who is not working with law enforcement. <laughs> Your encrypted messages are being delivered right over to the police. So, he's, he's, he's just... Look, I, I, it, and it, by the way, it's a little, uh, a little deja vu, huh? that the city of Miami has an officer that gets caught ripping off drug dealers, a la the uh, Miami River cops, remember? Yeah, well, this is this is similar. I mean, obviously, there's no death involved. I want to read one more paragraph. It was on, on a lower scale, but... I, I, want to, I want to read one more paragraph. On October 16th, 2023, the associate introduced CNAT to the CHS at a meeting at the associate's office in Broward County. This meeting was consensually recorded by the CHS. Now, remember, the CHS is the confidential human source, which means that right now they are a de facto law enforcement officer. They are acting and operating under the direction of law enforcement. So they are protected by what's called the law enforcement exception to Florida's two-party consent requirement. Normally, if, I'm, if Ed and I are having a conversation and I want to surreptitiously record that conversation, if I don't tell him and I record him without his knowledge and consent, I'm committing a crime. It doesn't matter the why of it. It's irrelevant. I could have the purest motives in the world. Correct. The fact is, we live in a two-party consent state. Of, but as a matter of fact, the reason behind it, the only thing it'll determine is whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony. That's right. So, so there is an exception to the two-party consent, and that is for law enforcement when they're conducting legitimate investigations. And that's what this is. So... Now it's being recorded. CNAT shows up and introduces himself as, quote, free nail. The associate CNAT and the CHS discuss an opportunity for CNAT to stop an individual immediately following a drug transaction and to steal approximately $50,000 that that individual would have. During the meeting, CNAT showed the CHS his MPD unmarked police vehicle, even sounding the lights and siren. He described how he likes to set up the, quote, play. The term play being described as a scheme to steal drugs and or money from an individual who was known to just have engaged in a drug transaction. He described his preference to do traffic stops after receiving intelligence about a drug transaction and the participating individuals so that he can use that information during the stop to ensure compliance with his demands. CNAT indicated that he conducts these traffic stops outside of his jurisdiction as a police officer and while off duty. CNAT stated, quote, on duty, they, MPD, got computers on and can track you and shit like that. You know what I mean? Ping your phone. What are you doing in this area? You don't want to do that shit, bro, while you're on duty. And quote, if I work down there, I will never fuck down there, bro. CNAT well, he's got he's got some principles, Michael. Never CNAT, while he's actually on duty. CNAT and the associate discussed several prior bad acts involving drug transactions where they had coordinated and conducted traffic stops, utilizing CNAT's position and authority as a police officer to coerce individuals stop to give up drugs, money, or both to CNAT in lieu of going to jail. CNAT stated, quote, I just need bread now. And he also discussed various bills that he planned to pay with the money obtained from his upcoming play. So now that you guys understand, the associate is a, is a prior convicted individual who was involved in these drug ripoffs with CNAT. The associate went to the CHS, who's the, the 
confidential informant working with the FBI and said, look, I've got a guy who's a cop who I want to do in order to get favor. The CS, the confidential human source, then goes to the FBI and says, I've got a guy who can get a guy. And when they find out it's a cop and they're able to start listening to some of these recordings, or this is, remember, this is October 16th. This is a full month before the, uh, almost a full month before the first several weeks before the first incident and a full month before the arrest. So the conspiracy, this actual crime starts to begin on that day when they start planning it, right? That would be October 16th. So this is only a month long investigation. It's really not that long, but they've already got this guy on tape bragging about prior acts that he's done with the guy who actually did it with him. So it's not just him trying to serve himself up as being a tough guy or a big guy. He's actually got a corroborating source sitting there backing him up. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm the one who fed him this information and I'm the one who did this with him. And I could tell you right now that this guy could do it because we've already done it so many times. Capiche? Right. So this is what the feds are now working with. Now, when you've got these recordings, then you have a series of, 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 of obviously... Uh, conversations and text messages and the phone calls, by the way, were also through signal uh, just kind of like you can do a WhatsApp call also that's encrypted. Apparently you can do that on signal as well. So they were doing the calls and the messaging and this guy seen at the whole time, believing that everything was, you know, kept in a nice little tight package and nobody was going to get it, not realizing that everything is being handed off to the FBI. Anecdotally, Michael, I'll let you stick to the facts and I think, I'll just be like the color guy. I'll be like your John Madden on the NFL game, okay? It just shows you – obviously what he did shows you the man is – is, and I'm sorry. I, I'm going to be a little – Corrupt. Corrupt is the word. I'm going to be a little opinionated, okay? He's obviously an idiot, um, and this shows you that he's a horrific – police officer because if he was a if he was even a decent halfway decent cop he would have understood that signal does not ensure any kind of safety you don't know like what happened to him if the person you're actually dealing with is a confidential informant or for god's sake so you see he didn't know if it was even an undercover he has no clue who these people are so what he thinks magically if he talks on signal he's protected you're only protected on signal if somebody's trying to uh, uh, after the fact, go go look for these text messages. So I don't know what he was thinking, but clearly he wasn't thinking much. Secondly, I want to bring up something that I bring up all the time. People don't usually commit major crimes or do anything major without incrementally getting there, <clears throat> right? Even somebody who, let's say, somebody who's never cheated on their spouse doesn't come out and just cheat on their spouse, Okay. They start flirting a little bit at the office or at a happy hour. They go and have a couple of drinks. Then they flirt a little more aggressively, maybe even hold hands or a kiss. But people don't just say, you know, I'll never cheat on my wife. It's horrible. It's immoral. I can't do it. And then the following day say, ah, the hell with it. Let's go have an orgy. Doesn't happen that way. These things don't happen this way. This guy clearly, and there's evidence because like Michael said, in this case, there's a corroborator. But nine times out of 10, these major crimes of, of these situations like this start small. And where do they start small? Well, it probably started with CNAT taking a souvenir. Okay, As a narcotics prosecutor, I remember a unit at a police department that, that got this banded, a narcotics unit that got this banded, because they would take souvenirs when they would arrest people. And so it usually starts that way. A souvenir here, a souvenir there. Uh, you pop some guy uh, on the street with a, a baggie of cocaine, some some Joe, as we call him, Joe Crackhead, with a, a rock of crack and 20 bucks, and they take his 20 bucks. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is what people need to be weary of. When you don't have principles, you mm -hmm. end up like this. When you have principles, you got a better shot of not ending up like this. Because if this man had had principles from day one of... I swore an oath I'm a cop. I cannot break the law because I've sworn to uphold these very same laws. He never would have started whatever his small endeavor on this road was. And that's just, you know, my, my, my PSA for the day. Don't start even with the small shit 
have principles and stick to them because it will lead you down the road to the bigger things. Well, I want to I want to jump on that and talk a little bit about secrets because you know, there's a lot have been said about secrets. Ben Franklin said, um, what was his quote? Three may keep a secret if two of the three are dead. <laughs> you know, if you want to keep something secret, you don't tell anybody. Right. So the minute that you start talking to anyone, you run risk. And that's exactly what happened here. This guy thought that he was dealing with a partner in crime. What he was dealing with was a partner in crime who was willing to sell him out in a heartbeat. And, and that is the nature of narcotics cases in particular. And, and at the end of the day, this is a public corruption case because it's a police officer defendant. But it's also a narcotics case because it deals with dope and dope ripoffs. And the way that narcotics cases get made, apart from, you know, you basic traffic stop where the officer smells marijuana in the car, the way that these things generally get done is by proactive police work. And it's almost all based on human intelligence. It's based on whether it's confidential information provided by somebody who's already been arrested or whether it's network information that they're getting from other jurisdictions or other law enforcement agencies. In this case, we're dealing with a joint task force. We have a million joint task forces. They're everywhere. You have joint task forces on a state level where FDLE will jump in bed with the Miami. Ed, Ed, had, a, um, Ed had a public corruption case. I don't know if it's still open or, or not. I don't want to talk too much about it. But... Ed had a case where he had a city of Miami police officer that was involved in a narcotics uh, investigation that was accused of taking some of the cash. Uh, and, and he was arrested when they, they found the cash. And by the way, it turned out the whole thing was a big sting up because, okay. because it was all being done and coordinated by internal affairs and outside police departments that had information about a dirty cop. Not the cop that got arrested that Ed was representing, another cop. Who didn't get arrested? And, and I get, look, that's a prime example of what I'm talking about. The guy that the investigation in that case was targeting is a guy that had been suspect, suspected of stealing twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars from drug dealers in the past, dealers. And in this case, my client, <clears throat> um, and I'll still use the word allegedly, but I'm not going to definitely tell you who the client is. The case is over, by the way. He ended up taking a plea to a withhold in court costs. Um, no, and probation. I think when right, you, and he was only charged with theft. I mean, it wasn't. It was only thirteen hundred dollars, and that's my point. See, even if my client never did it before, and even if let, let's assume he'd never done it before, which I believe uh, wholeheartedly, he never had done this before. Thirteen hundred dollars <throat> that he thought was overlooked because all the money had already been counted. So it was only thirteen hundred dollars. He didn't steal the 17000 that they tried to plant for this thing as bait money to see if somebody would steal. He only took 1300 And guess what? Michael, if this was a real drug dealer, <clears throat> he would have got away with it. And you know what would have happened? Next time, he would have stole 5000 And a time after that, he'd take 15000 And a time after that, he takes 50000 That's my point. Well, and where I was going with it was similar. It's the same type of a ladder where you're going up rungs, although I wasn't referring to the, uh, the the accused, I'm referring to the law enforcement angle. And, and so what they do, this is why when you're a 17 year old kid driving your car in Weston and you get pulled over at two o'clock in the morning and the cop finds your, your bag of weed uh, and then basically says to you, either you're going to you know work for me and tell me where you got the weed or you're gonna go to prison for five years and tries to scare the living shit out of you. I mean, most 17-year-old kids don't know any better, and it's not until they ultimately get home and tell their parents what happened that they're able to reach out and talk to someone like Ed or I, who, who then gets on the phone with the officer and says, don't you fucking threaten my client again. If you plan on arresting him, so be it. But he ain't working for you, and your threats are, are, are not uh, going to fly and go unnoticed. So, uh, you know, but it's called this ladder because that's the way it works. They pop the low guy. The low guy gives them the next guy up the rung. They pop that guy, they go up the rung next. They're always trying to get to the top of the ladder. They're trying to climb that ladder up to the sky. And so it's a never ending uh, staircase. It doesn't have a ceiling because they're never going to get El Chapo. They're never going to get the guy at top. They're never, and if they do kill Pedro Escobar, Pablo Escobar, guess what? Somebody takes his place. There's another one waiting in the wings. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's not, a never not only is there another one waiting, there's another one going, yes. Right. It's, it's a vicious cycle. But that said, 
especially in a case like this. And again, I have to differentiate it from most state cases because even even your best state court narcotics investigations and, and some of them, you know, you know, from both sides of the fence, some of them are very well organized with very good cops who know what they're doing, play it by the numbers, document it left and right. But still, they can't pace with the feds the way the feds do it. It's almost always airtight, which is why they have such an incredible conviction rate in federal court. They generally don't bring charges that they can't win. And if they're going to lose, they generally lose by what's called a jury nullification as opposed to on the law or the facts itself. Right. They get a popular subject. Yeah, like, but, but, I know that I know OJ was a state court case, but I'm using it as an example here. You get a guy who you could charge him with whatever, but it doesn't matter because he will never be convicted in that town of anything. OJ was a hero at that time. He was the Oakland boy. There was no jury ever was going to convict him, even with the most absurd and flimsy defense that anybody might have come up well, with, no matter how good the lawyers were. There was, and I, I'm privy to, to this inside information because I was studying with a, one of the top jury consultants at the time and when I was in my undergrad. There was. There was a specific demographic, a couple of specific demographics um, based on, on race and gender that would have found him guilty. But there was also a specific race and gender that was at the top of the list of being the hardest to find him guilty. And Marsha Clark believed that she knew better than the jury consultants. And she specifically chose, because obviously the defense, their jury <laughs> consultants told the same thing. So, but, but, yeah, there's, there's, you're right. He was not going to, it was going to be hard to get a conviction. Right. That's the bottom line. It's about that's, the feds. That's the bottom my line. Pet so peeve about the feds. My pet peeve about the feds. Yeah, they don't take anything tough. Okay. All their cases are slam dunks. It's, if, if it's even remotely difficult to prove it, they're going to let it go by the wayside. And as far as you're right, on the state side, and it's not so much about the resources, Mike. You'd be surprised. Remember, I was there. It's not so much the resources. It's, the fact that the state attorneys are overwhelmed. Okay, we've had, we got so many cases. Uh, uh, you know, when I was in narcotics, I was supposed to have a ma maximum of 150 cases. That was seen as, you know, a break. Like uh, that was a low number that, that a special unit prosecutor has. 150 cases is a lot of cases. So it, they're overwhelmed and, and sometimes it's hard to expect a state attorney who's overwhelmed to put in 70, 80 hours a week when they're getting paid peanuts. So that's that's one of the main reasons. All right. So we've hit an awful lot of the points that I wanted to talk about. Joint joint federal state task forces, uh, public corruption cases, federal versus state uh, investigations, long term versus in the moment arrests. Uh, meticulous nature of federal uh, uh, system, ladder to the top in narcotics investigations, confidential informants, uh, secrets, uh, bragging, encrypted apps may not be as safe as you think, law enforcement exception to the two-party consent law, text messages can constitute electronic evidence. We've covered all that already, believe it or not. I want to talk a little bit about what happened here because it's slightly different in federal court. So, Normally what happens, and I suspect that in this case, they just thought that this guy was so bad and so dangerous that he had to be taken down right away. Because normally what the feds would do is they would allow this to go on for quite some time. They wouldn't end it in a month. They'd let it go on for six months or a year. And then they would have already gone to the grand jury and secured an indictment. But they didn't do that in this case. They did not get an indictment. They filed a criminal complaint. And so I want the audience to understand the difference is that federal prosecutors, when they initiate a federal case, can do it one of two ways. They can either do it the, the longer, safer route, which is to secure an indictment. They take the case to a grand jury. They put forth their evidence. And if the grand jury believes that they've met their burden of showing that, that, that an indictment should issue, uh, then an indictment does issue. And if not, then it doesn't. They go back to the drawing board and could go get more evidence and reconvene a grand jury again. Correct. But sometimes they have to act quick. And I suspect that that's what happened in this case, that they decided, look, we're just not going to let this guy go back to work as a police officer for one more minute of one more hour of one more day. He's done. We're doing him now. And when they do that, they have to file something. 
So they prepare what's called a criminal complaint. And as I think I started the show, the criminal complaint is basically a sworn statement of probable cause. It's all it is. So when you get arrested on the criminal complaint, just like in the state system, you get rolled over to court, you go in front of a judge, and the judge has to review that criminal complaint the same way that they would review a arrest report or a probable cause affidavit in state court. They have to make a determination whether or not the complaint shows enough to be able to uh, move forward. And if it does, then they get to the next steps of the process. So this guy was taken into custody on Thursday the 16th. On Friday the 17th, he was brought in front of a U.S. magistrate judge in Broward County. And the magistrate judge reviewed the criminal complaint, found probable cause. Uh, there was probably a, a, a request for bond that was denied. He was pretrial detained. And they've set the case out for a bond hearing. And that will occur in a, in a week or 10 days or whatever it is. And then subsequently further proceedings will occur. The reason that I bring up the criminal complaint is once the indictment is received, if they go the indictment route, that's it. The case is already launched. There's no turning back at that point. It's either a plea or a trial or a resolution by a dispositive motion. The criminal complaint adds another layer to it because one of two things has to happen with a criminal complaint. Either A, the accused can stipulate to moving forward on the criminal complaint. In other words, they can say, judge, I understand I have a right to be indicted by a grand jury, which they do. They have an absolute constitutional and federal criminal procedure right to be indicted by a grand jury. I get it, but I'm waving. Don't need it. We can go forward on the criminal complaint. If the defendant does that, if the accused does that, no problem, the case goes forward. However, if the accused says, I want my indictment, the government's only got 30 days from the day that they file that criminal complaint to secure an indictment. And if they don't, they've got problems. So when they go forward on criminal complaints and when the defendant waves and says, I'll go forward on that, it's usually because they want to cooperate right up front themselves and get the best deal possible. And that may or may not happen in this case. I've never met soon to be ex officer seen at. Uh, I don't know anything about the man. I don't know who's representing him. I, I don't know whether he's in denial or whether he understands the gravity of his situation. But assuming that the government has everything that they've outlined in their in their criminal complaint, some of which we've summed up for you, this might be a very good case where he might be thinking the best thing that I can do for myself right now is to plead guilty very quick, very early, cost the government absolutely no money and no aggravation, get the maximum reduction in points for accepting responsibility and throw my throw myself on the spear and hope that the judge has some compassion. You know, as, as, Go ahead. As, as an aside, I, I, I've always had an issue with, or let me rephrase that. Let me, let me, let me discuss it in the positive. I really like, and I wish the state system would do the same. I really like that in the federal, if you take a plea, if you come in and take a plea willingly, that you get a little bit of benefit for it, that they give you the benefit for accepting responsibility for what you do. And I'll tell you, Michael, you and I have done it. How many times have you heard of a sentencing after a trial that the judge says, and you sat here and made us go through a trial because you wouldn't accept responsibility for your actions. But yet when the guy comes in and pleads up front, a judge never says, you know, I was going to give you 10 years for the, in this plea, but I'm going to give you eight because you came forward. They never do it. And I wish that state attorneys and judges in the state court system would get better training on that and that we would all agree because I mean, look, I understand that in the criminal justice system, it's punishment and rehabilitation, okay? There's no doubt we could sit here esoterically, morally arguing it, but the fact that it remains that this is the system we have. It's punishment and rehabilitation. But if we really are going to be serious about trying to rehabilitate people, then I think we need to look at what the federal system does in that situation where they, they tell you, look, the first, right, the first step to rehabilitation is accepting responsibility. So he probably will. I mean, Michael, I don't know who's representing him, but just in that criminal complaint, the evidence is overwhelming. And I'm sure that the feds have, having done this, we both know the feds are going to bombard him with even more audios and more recordings and more evidence of what this guy did. I don't know why he wouldn't, but you never know. You never know. Exactly. So I just took one second on that. 
the federal sentencing guidelines are different than Florida's sentencing guidelines. The concept is the same. It's designed to create a uniform system that doesn't matter what color you are, what religion you are, what your sexual orientation is, what your financial position in, in life is. It, it, should, it basically takes the offenses themselves and levels the playing field based on the, the allegations and then it provides the ability to plug in specific information relative to that individual, some of which is aggravating, meaning that it allows for more time, and some of which is mitigating, meaning that it allows for less time. So uh, Ed's right. Uh, there is a, 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 a rule of federal procedure which requires the court to reduce your overall sentencing guidelines computation, your category, your, your category level, uh, when you accept responsibility it's either a two or a three point drop depending upon the timeliness and of course also depending upon the severity of the crime that you're facing um so yeah that's built into it but at the same time the feds also have far more aggravating factors than the state of florida ever thought of so you know you can kind of balance that out okay but i'm not throwing out the baby because of the bathwater, right I'm just, i agree but i'm just saying there there's you know, there are differences and, and they cut both ways. So um, where where does CNAT go from here? Well, right now he's sitting in the Broward County Jail because Broward, unlike Dade, does not have a dedicated uh, federal detention center. Um, so they have a what they call a courtesy wing in the Broward County Jail for Broward County federal detainees. And so he's going to stay there as a guest of uh, the federal government vis-a-vis uh, the state of Florida and the county of Broward until he goes to his detention hearing. And that is scheduled for, in case anyone was wondering, uh, he was in court originally on Friday the 17th. His pretrial detention hearing is set for 1128, which is a week from uh, a week from tomorrow. So what will happen during that time is uh, probation will interview him and they will do a risk assessment, which will be presented to the to the court and to the prosecution and to the defense. And the defense attorney, whoever's assigned, whether he hires private counsel or he's appointed a uh, court appointed attorney. According, will, to him, according to him, he needed money to pay the bills. So yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, Florida, right. We, we, we won't know until we know. I, I know one thing for sure. He won't be using the marked federal hundred dollar bills uh, that, that he took from either of those individuals for legal fees. Um, unless the lawyer who accepts those marked hundred dollar bills wants to be sitting in the cell next to him. Um, so, uh, but the detention hearing, so what happens is he actually is pretrial detained and he's going to go to a hearing where they're going to reconsider that. And that's a little bit different in the federal system than it is in the state system. Um, he could have gotten a bond on the 17th if his charges were such that both the court and the prosecutor agreed that he should get a bond. So if he had been taken in on some silly, you know, non-victimless, non-dangerous, non-public uh, corruption offense, you know, like, I don't know, what's a minor... How, how, federal... about, how about this, Mike? If he had committed crimes at, in the, during the act of committing the crime, he was not armed... Well, I, I, I mean, I mean, look, let's look at Mike. Either, he, either he, way, let stay off the gun thing for a minute because we're, we're going to finish up with that. But my, my point being, if this were more innocuous, let's say that he had just, you know, filled out a firearms purchase form and lied on it. Let's say that he had not paid his taxes and he was charged with a criminal tax fraud. He would have gotten bond on the 17th unless he was a flight risk or presented an unreasonable danger. But because of the nature of these charges, because he is a police officer, because he had a badge and a gun and an official police issued vehicle, because he used those things to commit drug ripoffs, to take cash, to take narcotics. I mean, because he did all those things and on top of that, admitted to having done this however many times in the past, which I'm sure the feds know much more about than we know because they don't put all of that information in the, in the criminal complaint, obviously just enough to establish probable cause, but clearly far from everything they know. So because of all those things, he's going to be held until at least the 28th. 
uh, when he's going to go in for this detention hearing. And the government, no doubt, will seek pretrial detention. In other words, they're going to say, Judge, you cannot let this guy out on bond because he presents too much of a danger to the community. We can't trust him. There's no condition of release that you can impose that will satisfy the, the community to be safe from this man. So we need you to keep him locked up. And, and I would be willing to bet damn near anything that he will be pretrial detained under these facts and circumstances. They've also set the case for preliminary hearing, arraignment, and report rate counsel on 1201. So that's when it's going to be kind of a fish or cut bait type situation. Although, again, remember, the government has 30 days within which to seek an indictment. This guy could waive indictment. He could plead guilty at his arraignment for all we know. So, you know, there's an awful lot to unpack as to what could happen procedurally. But the bottom line is this guy is going to go through it. And I want to spend a couple minutes real quick just talking about what he's charged with. Um, Hobbs Act extortion. You want to you want to feel that for two seconds, Ed? Uh, well, you know, I looked at it briefly before the show. And one of the things that that was that stood out to me was the, the there's no need. Um, I'm sorry for the government. The second one. Sorry. I take that back for the second one on the Hobbs Act. Yeah, it's it's basically when he tells somebody when he threatens somebody that they need to give him money or they're going to have some <clears throat> negative repercussion, which in this case was go to prison. That's extortion. That's extortion. I mean, it's really simple. Very obtaining, simple. obtaining somebody else's property with their consent, but only because their consent was induced by your threat or actual use of force or violence. So. You know, when I, as a police officer, tell you, if you don't give me that drug money, I'm going to take you to jail and you give me the drug money. It's not a robbery. It's extortion. Correct. So so that's the crime. And and in this case, it's worse than just extortion, because I could you we can extort and give you a great example of legal ex extortion that lawyers need to be very careful about. Uh, and. I represent somebody who's accused of a crime and Ed represents the victim. And Ed comes to me and says, my client will drop all of the charges against your client if you pay him $10,000. That's called extortion. Right. It may be between two lawyers, but it's extortion. Clearly extortion. It is a quid pro quo. It is a use, a threat of use of force or violence in order to receive somebody else's property with consent. So... What distinguishes this extortion from any other extortion is that this was done under color of authority because he was a police officer. And even if he wasn't a police officer, if he was pretending to be a police officer. But in this case, he actually was a police officer. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't much color about it. He really was a cop. Right. So, well, it's, it, the language that they use is actually, quote, color of official right. So he is an official, but he's not acting in his official capacity. Right. Obviously, he's not on duty. He's not in jurisdiction and he's not performing the functions, the sworn functions or duties of a police officer. Yet he is using that appearance in order to further the extortion. And so when Ed and I were talking about enhancements and mitigation a few minutes ago, like when he was talking about acceptance of responsibility, this is an example of the exact opposite. This crime is much more serious when a person who actually is a police officer purports to be acting as a police officer when they commit this crime. Do you understand how that aggravates the circumstance? Right. So, so that's that one. The next one, theft of government funds, is the one Ed had a little bit of a problem with. Go yeah, ahead. I'm looking at it and thinking, honestly, Michael, I'm looking at it going, these bastards, they set up this thing with government money and then charge him for stealing the government money, but he thought it was a drug dealer, right? So, Well, in fairness... In fairness, we don't know whether or not the government ever got back that first thirty-nine thousand. Right. Well, remember sure. he took. Remember he took fifty-two thousand the first time. He met up with the the uh, human source and gave that human source the cut of thirteen grand, which was a quarter. He kept seventy-five percent, which was thirty-nine thousand, and we don't know if that money was ever recovered. Well, and, and here's the bad yeah. news for him: it wouldn't matter because, for example. Uh, when I was again, when I was a prosecutor, sometimes in these undercover stings, these cops, a couple of times the cops would come to me as undercovers and say, well, you know, he said that if I was a cop, he would kill me and my family. I want to charge him with threat of a law enforcement officer. 
Well, one of the things you have to prove under the state statute of threat of a law enforcement officer. I had to know it was a law enforcement. You knew, right? So I'm thinking, how could they charge him? I mean, he'd have to know, right? Nope. Unfortunately, and I'll, I'll pull you up. In, in the feds. In the feds. I'll pull right. a rabbit out of your hat, Michael. 18 U.S. Code Section 641 reads, whoever, in, now notice nowhere in there does it say he had to know that he was stealing government property. Whoever embezzles, steals, purloins, or knowingly converts, knowingly converts, that's the only knowingly part, converts to his use or the use of another or without authority, sells, conveys, or disposes of any record, voucher, money, or anything of value of the U.S. government or of any government or agency thereof or any property made or being made under contract for the United States government uh, or any department or agency thereof, or whoever receives, conceals, retains the same with the intent to convert to the use or gain, knowing it to have been embezzled, stolen, or born and converted, shall be, and there it goes. So you don't even need to know that it's government property or money. If you steal, and it just so happens that it was government property, you're guilty of the theft and guilty of this statute. So I suspect, Michael, that they really don't care whether they got the money back or not. They nailed him with it for it anyway. And I I, I mean, look, I haven't done the well, research. And the other thing is they can print another $39,000 a lot quicker than I just said that. Yeah, they could just email Joe Biden and ask him. Let's talk about the last. Say. Let's talk about the last one. 30 seconds, please, because we're running out of time. But I want you to explain to our audience how it is, first off, I, I, and I don't understand the why of this. I understand the answer to the question I'm going to ask, but I don't understand why the government used fake drugs instead of real drugs. But either way, he is charged with, uh, basically with with uh, uh, um, uh, 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 fake drugs as, as opposed to actual narcotics, right? The charge is attempted possession with intent to distribute, not possession with intent to distribute because he never had cocaine. Get right. fake cocaine. So why, how is it that fake drugs can get you in trouble just like real drugs? Well, fake drugs can get you in trouble because it's the, the fact that you were acting on it as if you thought it was real, which is why they're hitting him with an attempt. Why they chose to do that, there's many reasons. Again, <clears throat> and I am strictly speculating because I have no idea. I can just tell you from my own experience, things that have occurred in the past, right? Believe it or not, Michael, one of them could be that this came up so fast they wanted to move on this quickly. They didn't get enough time to get the authority to get cocaine released to them as part of the investigation. So they said, screw it, just go with whatever, baby powder. Um, could be that they, they didn't feel comfortable putting the cocaine out there, that he might be, you know, get lost with the cocaine and they never get it back. And then not that they care, other than the optics, that then there's there's a there's a write-up in the in the Herald and all over CNN and FB, you know, uh, Fox that these cops let a kilo of cocaine on the street. CNN so, wouldn't report that. <laughs> oh, CNN would. Fox might not. Fox might be like, what? They're nice guys. They're cops. Um, but there's there's a slew of reasons. I suspect that it, it probably was the first. I think well, there, was- there is, there's a crime in Florida. There's a state court crime for, for selling fake drugs. Yeah. There, there's an actual statute. If, if, if I sell Martinez a gram of fake cocaine, I've committed a crime. And, and I would call the cops on you. Right, exactly. The cops to arrest you. This bastard, he was supposed to sell me some illegal cocaine. It's not enough <laughs> It's not enough that he shorted me. It's not even coke. So the, the last thing that I want to talk about, we've kind of touched, is the sentencing enhancements for the abuse of position of trust or use of special skill, firearms, things like that. All of those things raise the stakes. Um, you know, it's great if he goes in there and says, Judge, I'm sorry, and does his mea culpa and gets his three points off. But he's going to get racked up so high for all of the um, all of these other enhancements, particularly that abuse of, of uh, position of trust. When you're a cop, you are held to a higher standard, like it or not. It's that simple. Um, and, and, and so they're going to get prosecuted and hammered on the sentencing guidelines more than if it were a non-law enforcement officer who committed the same offense. The enhancement wouldn't apply. But think about the same type of thing where, um, you know, if a, if a school teacher or if a school coach uh, or if a therapist uh, sexually molests 
a, uh, a student or a patient or a uh, athlete, that's enhanced because that person had a special position of trust that they took advantage of. And so that's why those types of enhancements exist. The firearms, obviously, you can all figure out. Uh, you know, we have a 1020 life law in Florida. If you don't have a gun on you, you don't have to worry about 1020 life now, do you? You can right. still commit the robbery. You can still commit the burglary, but it won't be armed and it won't get jacked up to 1020 life. All right. And I, I just want to add, my mm. it should be enhanced when you're put. Look, nobody put these people in that position. <clears throat> I had, for example, when I was a state attorney. It, it was completely illegal to smoke marijuana in Dade County, right? In Florida. Well, there was no medical marijuana in Florida when I was a prosecutor. Obviously, cocaine and all these drugs are illegal. And I always used to say, even smoking marijuana as a prosecutor is just 100% unacceptable because you're put in a position of trust and authority. You swear, you take an oath to uphold the laws of the state of Florida. And then you go and break them. Yeah, Michael, I got to be honest with you. I think the penalty should be harsher for somebody who chose. Nobody asked Senate. Nobody forced Senate to be a cop. Senate chose to be a cop. No, I, I think we all, I think we can pretty much all agree with that. There's one more thing I want to hit and I know we're over. So I just want to hit it quickly. Um, entrapment. Pretty much the only defense that you have is entrapment. And it ain't going to fly here. And the reason it's not going to fly here is because by his own admission on tape, this is what he does. And entrapment only applies to people who ordinarily would not do that, but for the fact that the police or an agent of the police, be it a confidential informant or whatnot, pushed you to do something you otherwise were not, quote, predisposed to do. So when you are caught on tape talking about how this is how I like to set up my plays, this is how I like to do it because it works best this way. When you're bragging on even encrypted apps, when you go through that whole protocol and basically rat yourself out, you've shot any chance that you had an entrapment. Because in order to even get that instruction, you have to be able to convince the judge that it's applicable to the case. Yep. Any, exactly. any final thoughts on that? No. Um, I think I've said certainly my piece. Um, and, you know, I do wish everybody involved the best, but Senate, you got nobody to blame but yourself, my friend. Now, I'm not a I'm not a betting man, Ed. I, I don't I don't gamble uh, as a general rule, but I would like to set an over under with you. Do you think that this guy Sinat is going to enter a guilty plea before or after his arraignment? <laughs> oh, no, I, I listen. At I only, or after his arraignment. I, I only bet on myself, and this is exactly why, because I have no idea how stupid this man is. So, I, I mean, look, I, I don't know. I don't know. Again, it's not my case, and you and I both know better than to, to say something without having enough discovery. But I got to tell you, it looks to me like... Well, right remember, now, if they go, remember, they go through the discovery process in federal court, his plea gets a lot worse. So his no, lawyer is going to sit down... Hey, but, but in fairness to the feds, let me tell you, they're going to give his defense attorney enough discovery... To prove to him that it's in his best interest to plead it out, so that's but that's he knows. But he about. know. But he knows it already. He he he's read Michael. his own criminal complaint and he knows what he said and he knows who he said it to and now he knows all those people were working with the government. So how he, many he, are, how many clients have you had that we were like he he knows better? I don't need the discovery. He knows exactly what it. And they still fight. They still say I want to go to true. trial. I'm like okay. And and, and as we started the show, we're going to finish it here. He's still presumed innocent. Absolutely. So at, at this juncture, he's guilty of nothing, even though he is being pretrial detained. Um, and even though they've got him on audio and video and texts and apps and everything else under the sun, uh, he still does enjoy that Fifth Amendment presumption of innocence. I wish Officer Senat, or as I say, soon to be well, ex-Officer Senat, the best of luck. Um, listen, he could be acquitted in this case. But I tell you one thing, he ain't ever going to be a police officer again. Yeah. They're stripping that law enforcement certification from him, and he wouldn't be able to get hired as a uh, security guard in a shopping mall right now, an outdoor shopping mall. I suspect so, he's going to do some prison time. 
he's definitely going to do some prison time. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for bearing with us today. I think this was a very interesting conversation. It certainly was a, a, a an interesting story. Thank you for pulling it, Ed. Thank you to the federal government for being so diligent about putting their documents online uh, so that we can read them and, and, and talk intelligently with the audience as opposed to speculating as to what might have happened. At least this way we were operating off of an absolute concrete uh, uh, statement of probable cause by the government. So that's a wrap for episode number 79 of At Your Service with Haber and Martinez. Uh, I don't know if we're going to see you next week or not. I have a case tentatively set for trial, but we'll know whether or not it's going when it sounds on Wednesday. Uh, if we don't see you on the uh, 27th, then I suppose we'll see you in the first week of December. Either way, uh, we're looking forward to being back at your service for episode number 80, the big 80. Uh, we'll be octogenarians the next time we do one of these shows, Ed. Yep. I'm almost right, there. Everybody. You're, al you're almost there already. Thank you. Thank you again for your kind time, your attention. We hope that you got something out of the show. Feel free to call us if you have questions, comments, or concerns. And we'll look forward to seeing you hopefully next week again for episode number 80. Thank you very much, folks. Be good. And thank you very much to the good folks at Miami Communities Newspapers who always do such a fabulous job at producing our show. We'll see you next time. Thank you again. Thank you, guys.